Courtney. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Navigating Guardianships and Conservatorships for the last iteration of our series today. I'm Courtney Tarver, and I'm a volunteer with AARP Alabama. I'll be your host for this conversation about guardianships and conservatorships. And we are joined today by Ms. Connie Glass of the Elder Law Firm of Connie Glass PC in Huntsville, Alabama. Connie Glass is with uh, the Elder Law Firm and prior to opening the firm in 97, she served as the attorney for the Tarcog Area Agency on Aging for over 10 years and was on the staff of the University of Alabama Law School. Ms. Glass is certified as an elder law attorney by the National Elder Law Foundation and is one of only six certified elder law attorneys in Alabama. She currently serves on the Alabama Court Commission on Adult Guard Alabama, excuse me, Alabama Supreme Court Commission on Adult Guardianships and Conservatorships, as have all of our speakers during the series, formerly known as the WINGS organization that was a task force that did research and work to develop our laws here in Alabama on guardianships and conservatorships. She's a charter member of the Alabama State Bar Elder Law Section and currently serves as treasurer of the section. She's also a member of the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, the National Elder Law Foundation, and the Huntsville Madison County Bar Association. She's a graduate of the University of Alabama, having received her BA in 1978 and her Juris Doctor degree from the University of Alabama, Alabama Law School in 1981. Um, good morning, Connie. Good morning. Roll time. <laughs> Sorry to all my Auburn friends. Um, thank y'all so much. Courtney, anything else before I jump in? Real quickly, sure. uh, we just have been letting everyone know that during this series, we've been trying to take the subtopics of guardianships and conservatorships and breaking them down so that they would be a little bit more understandable. And today, uh, Connie will be talking about the responsibilities of guardians and conservators. So um, as was stated before we started, uh, if you want to ask questions, uh, probably the best way is to write your questions in the chat box, uh, but you may also raise your hand and we'll acknowledge you at the appropriate time. Um, and uh, we just appreciate everybody being here with us. Thank you, Connie. Thank you, Courtney. I'm so pleased to be here with y'all today. We have a wonderful group, it looks like. Um, we definitely want this to be a learning experience for you, so please feel free to ask questions. Um, we're This morning, we're going to watch two separate videos. We're going to watch first the um, responsibilities of a guardian video. Um, we're going to, after we finish that video, then we're going to open it up for questions, comments, concerns about the responsibilities of a guardian. Um, once we cover that topic, then we'll move on to the responsibilities of a conservator. We have a video to show for that one also, excellent video. And then we'll open that up for questions after we finish with that um, video. It's important to distinguish between guardianship, conservatorship. A lot of clients and people in the community get those two mixed up. We all know that guardianship is responsibility for the person, whereas conservatorship is responsibility for the financial and business affairs of that person. Some people have guardians only. Some people have conservators only. Some people have both guardians and conservators. So it's, it's again, important to distinguish between the, due and, between the two and the responsibilities of the two. Um, that you could have a person who serves as a guardian and a different person serve as a conservator. We, we find that frequently where one person is more attuned to the medical needs and the personal needs and one person has a more of a skill set in managing the finances. So it can be the same person, it can be separate people. So it's again important to distinguish between the two. 
Um, these videos are excellent and I encourage you to listen to them real carefully. Um, I've watched them. They're, they're great, great information. And I think it will lead to a good discussion on guardianships and conservatorships. So, Anne, if we can go ahead and watch the responsibilities of the guardian video and then we'll take questions after that. If you are appointed as a guardian for an adult, your fundamental responsibility is to make decisions about their personal affairs. You become their surrogate decision maker, advocate, and coordinator of services. You are there as protector to make sure they are safe and their needs are taken care of. You are also there to encourage their self-reliance and independence and make sure their rights are respected. In this video, we will talk about the responsibilities that come with being someone's guardian and give you some ideas on how best to perform those duties. The first thing to remember is that a guardianship involves three parties, you, the person you are guardian for, and the court that appointed you. Most often, this will be the county probate judge. Pay close attention to any paperwork the court gives you. Your letters of guardianship and the court's order appointing you will explain what authority you have. The probate judge may also have special instructions or deadlines for you to follow. For example, the judge can require you to report on the condition of the person you are guardian for. So follow the court's directions and do what the judge asks. If you have any questions about what you can and can't do, you should talk to your lawyer. Unless the judge limits your authority, you are responsible for the health, support, education, and maintenance of the person you are appointed for. This includes making the following types of decisions. Acquiring proper health care, rehabilitation, consenting to medical treatment, hiring and firing doctors, nurses, caregivers, and other professionals, choosing living accommodations, authorizing education and vocational training, arranging for transportation and social services, even consenting to marriage. These are heavy responsibilities, and guardians should exercise them with the utmost care and diligence. Decision-making starts with knowing the incapacitated person, their needs, values, and preferences. Alabama law requires a guardian to become and remain personally acquainted with the person they are guardian for. The guardian has to maintain sufficient contact with the person to know what their abilities and limitations are, to understand their needs and their physical and mental health. When it comes to making decisions, there are three questions you should be asking. What would the person do? What is best for them? And what decision places the fewest restrictions on their independence? First, think about what the person would do if they had the ability to make their own decisions. This is called substituted judgment. You might know the person well enough to have that answer. You may have talked to them about these issues before you were appointed as their guardian. And you might still be able to communicate with the person about their wishes. Speak with people who know the person's preferences, such as family, friends, caregivers, or clergy, and the person may have written some things down to make their wishes known. Look to their will, power of attorney, living will, or other documents for direction. Then make the decision based on what the person would do if they could. If you don't know what the incapacitated person would decide, you'll need to make a decision that is in their best interest. In Alabama, you always need to keep the person's best interest in mind. Acting in their best interest means weighing the benefits against the risks any act or decision will have on the person. It means considering all possibilities and choosing the option that will have the greatest benefit and result in the least harm to the person. You may need to seek out independent opinions from experts such as doctors, social workers, attorneys, or government agencies to help you with the process. And with this information, make the best decision for the person in the circumstances. Finally, you should also consider what is called the least restrictive alternative. This means choosing the option that meets the needs of the incapacitated person while placing the fewest limits on their independence and dignity. 
When thinking about the least restrictive alternative, it is helpful to know the person's preferences, get professional opinions, and learn about the community resources available to them. For example, what health or caregiving services are available for a person to live independently and safely at home. Try to choose the alternative that meets the needs of the person while promoting their rights and freedoms. In the next video, we will talk about the duties of conservators. Okay, um, so that was just a real um, an overview of the responsibilities of a guardian. Um, so at this point, let's go ahead and open it up for questions if you have any. Otherwise, I've got a few things that that I wanted to share. Um, so if you've got any questions, let's go ahead and and, and deal with those first um, about guardianships. While we're waiting on any questions to come up, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the importance of a guardian. I've served um, in all the capacities in a guardianship. I actually file guardianships um, as the attorney. I also serve as guardian ad litem um, in my probate court in being appointed to represent the incapacitated person. So the issues that I see with guardianships so often is if, particularly when it's a spouse, when a spouse is appointed as a guardian for another spouse, or even a child, an adult child is appointed as a guardian for a parent, it's very difficult sometimes for that person who's appointed as guardian to make decisions that the parent or the spouse doesn't agree with. Um, so if an ch adult child is appointed as a guardian and mom really needs to be placed into a facility, sometimes it's difficult when mom is, is actively not wanting to go to a facility, is, is expressing uh, anger, um, frustration with having to go to a facility, not understanding their medical needs. And it's very, very hard for a child to shift into the role of a guardian. Um, where they have to do what's in the best interest of the person, not necessarily what that person wants. It's also very difficult for spouses. Um, so I think it's real important when you're dealing with families in the guardianship situation to make sure that the guardian understands that they're working from either substituted judgment, which means that they have to substitute their judgment the judgment of the, the ward, the incapacitated person, what would that person have wanted to do if they were of completely sound mind and able to make their own decisions? Or if there is nothing to indicate what they would have wanted, that best interest standard, what is in that person's best interest? And many, many times it is not what the person wants. Um, that's often when we have to do the guardianships, when someone needs care that they're not accepting that they need, they need to be in a more secure environment and they're not accepting that they need that type of care. They can't because of their cognitive impairment or whatever the issue is that's causing them to need the guardianship. Um, so it's, it's very important when you're working with these kind of people to walk through that process with them to help them understand you're going to have to make some tough decisions as a guardian. You may have to take away the car. You may have to stop the driving. You may have to move them to a place that they really don't want to live. They may have to move out of the home. Keep it in mind that the standard for guardianships is always least restrictive environment. So where can the person live and be safe in the least restrictive environment? Maybe home, but it may not be. What I struggle with with my clients is they believe that the guardianship is going to solve all the issues. Once they become guardian, then mom's just going to cooperate with them and do what needs to be, you know, enter the facility, go into assisted living, go to the doctor regularly, take her medicine. And I have to keep reminding my guardians that that guardianship really is a piece of paper. It's not going to make the person behave or make the person cooperate. And I think it's critical when we're advising people on guardianships that we don't 
um, give them a false sense that the guardianship is going to solve everything. It gives you the legal premise to make the decisions and the legal backing to do that. But it, it doesn't make the person more cooperative. It doesn't make them behave. Sometimes it just makes them angrier when a person is appointed as a guardian. Um, so I think it's really, really important that people go into guardianships with their eyes open, knowing what the guardianship means. Um, that there are things that we can do that don't necessarily, we don't have to get to that guardianship place. Um, where I'm a big believer in advanced medical directives, powers of attorney for healthcare, to give another person the ability to make those decisions. Um, but we always have to remember with those legal documents that never takes away the right of the person who gives that decision-making power to another. If I sign a medical power of attorney, giving someone the, the power to make decisions for me, it does not remove my right to make my own decisions. It gives that other person the same rights that I have, but my rights are not removed. Only a court can remove someone's rights to make decisions for themselves. So just giving someone power of attorney doesn't, again, mean that you may not have to do the guardianship. It may be necessary somewhere down the road, even when there is a medical directive or a healthcare power of attorney, okay? Um, if you're not comfortable typing your question and you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, I think we all are, are good with that. So if anybody has a question and wants to unmute and, and ask your question without having to type it, feel free to do that. Any questions, concerns? situations that you've been involved with that you want to, to discuss. Okay. Courtney, anything you wanted to add here on guardianships before we move on to conservatorships? I'm normally full of something to say, but not at this point. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's, um, then our next video is on conservatorships, um, which is the other component of the court process with an incapacitated person. Um, again, the conservatorship is control of the financial resources of the incapacitated person. Um, the conservator's duties are, are multitude when it comes to dealing with resources. And this video is gonna help you understand the responsibilities of a guardian. I mean, excuse me, the responsibilities of a conservator. Um, it is frequently there's a guardian and a conservator and frequently that person is the same. The guardian is the same person as the conservator. If you do have two different people, one serving as guardian and one serving as conservator, it's critical that those people work together. So you're going to see as we listen to this video about how the responsibilities of conservator are going to mesh with the responsibilities of the guardian. So Anne, let's look at this video. We've learned that a guardian is responsible for an incapacitated person's personal affairs and decisions, and a conservator is responsible for the person's money and property. In this video, we will talk about a conservator's duties. Just like a guardian, a conservator has responsibilities to both the incapacitated person and the court. A conservator must follow what's called the prudent person standard in handling an incapacitated person's money and property. To bring it all together, we will give you an outline of the four basic duties of a conservator. The first thing to remember is that a conservatorship involves three parties. You, the person you are conservator for, and the court that appointed you. In Alabama, chances are you have been appointed by a county probate judge. Always, always pay attention to the court's orders, letters of conservatorship, and any other papers the court sends you. There are certain minimum things that are required by Alabama law, like periodic accountings, but the probate judge can ask for more. The judge may also have specific deadlines and instructions for filing paperwork, like the accounting. The court's orders will also tell you what you can and cannot do with the person's money. In Alabama, a conservator's authority is divided into two categories, things you can do without prior court approval, and things you must get court approval to do. 
For example, you can, without court approval, invest and reinvest the person's money, but you must get prior approval from the judge to sell or dispose of the person's house or land. We can't, in this video, go over every transaction that requires approval. Start by reading the court's orders, letters of conservatorship, and anything else the court sends you. If you are unsure if you can do something, you should consult with your lawyer. For any action you take, you should follow the prudent person standard. For example, you should be careful when investing and reinvesting the incapacitated person's money. You are charged with the same duty of care owed by any prudent person dealing with the property of another. You have a duty to manage the person's estate effectively and to exercise due diligence. For example, you should be diligent in collecting money you know is owed to the incapacitated person and paying their bills on time. To put all of this together, let's outline the four basic duties of a conservator. These can be found in a guide published on our website called Managing Someone Else's Money, Help for Court-Appointed Conservators in Alabama. Suppose that you are appointed as Martin's conservator. The first duty is always to act in Martin's best interest. You should weigh the benefits and risks of any action you are taking on Martin's behalf. You may need to get advice from professionals, including financial advisors, accountants, and lawyers. But don't forget Martin. Ask him what he wants. Consider his preferences and what he would do if he were able. You need to set aside your own interest and those of other people. If you don't, that's called a conflict of interest. You have a duty to avoid conflicts of interest, so always focus on Martin's interest. The second duty is to manage Martin's money and property carefully. This goes back to the prudent person standard. The first thing a prudent person would do is to get a handle on Martin's property. Make an inventory of what Martin has. For example, bank and retirement accounts, investments, insurance policies, house, land, vehicles, and any personal possessions. Get an idea of what Martin owes in credit card bills and loans, and ask if anyone owes Martin money. Doing a complete inventory is not just a good idea. It is required by Alabama law. You will need to file an inventory with the court within 90 days of your appointment. The third duty is to keep Martin's money and property separate from your own. You should open a new FDIC-insured checking account in Martin's name with you listed as conservator. This is sometimes called an estate account. Deposit all of Martin's income into this account and none of yours. Pay all of Martin's bills and expenses out of this account, but none of yours or someone else's. You should also keep title to Martin's property in his name. Consult with your attorney if you have any questions about how Martin's bank accounts and property should be titled. The fourth duty is to keep good records and report to the court. Doing everything through Martin's separate estate account will really help in this regard. You will have bank statements showing all of his deposits and expenses. Use the account debit card for purchases, and whenever you need to, write checks so that you have check images. Avoid cash withdrawals. Beyond the bank records, you might want to keep a ledger of income and expenses. For larger or hard-to-explain purchases, you can keep receipts and notes with the ledger. The bottom line is you must be able to provide documentation and report to the court when needed. In Alabama, a conservator is required to submit an accounting to the court at least once every three years. In the next and final video of the series, we will discuss when a guardianship or conservatorship can be modified and ends. Excellent information. Um, I think we have one question in our chat so far. Um, question is, how did the COVID pandemic and shutdown affect the conservator, a conservator getting the court's approval for things that required approval from the court? That's an excellent question. Um, we struggled with that some during the, the pandemic. However, um, I think this is true in most probate courts. Our probate court never shut down. Um, we had to do um, hearings virtually. Um, so most of our hearings were done by Zoom. Um, but emergency guardianships, um, 
accountings for conservatorships, all of those things had to, you know, approval for sale of real property, all of those things had to continue to be done during the pandemic. Um, the law didn't allow us to stretch out the time limits um, on those things. Um, and property ended up having to be sold and, you know, people needed guardians and needed conservators. So I know that our court in Madison County continued to operate even through the pandemic. They never shut down. Um, again, everything had to be virtual, but we were able to, to continue on with what we needed to do. Um, some, please um, type your questions in. Feel free if you want to and raise your hand and mute yourself. Um, if you'd prefer to ask, ask your question verbally, that's perfectly fine. Um, I have no issue with that at all. And sometimes I express myself better trying to verbalize my question rather than type it. So you feel free to do that if you have questions. Um, confidentiality for guardians and conservators. Um, that's an excellent question. As far as the confidentiality of a guardian, you would treat that medical information the way you would treat your own medical information. You're not, you're not supposed to share that information with anyone that the court does not direct you to share that information with. Um, in, the, in the law, there are certain people that must be notified about the medical needs of the ward. Um, the guardian is supposed to notify the immediate next of kin when a person changes residences, if they move out of their home into a facility, if they um, uh, need medical care, that their medical care changes. That is definitely something that has to be reported to other family members, but that's, that's the law. So it is something that's approved in the law, but just to share medical information with anyone is, is not allowed. You should treat that medical information the way you would treat your own. As far as the, cons uh, the confidentiality duties of a conservator, of course, again, it's, it's important to not share someone's private financial information except as the court requires. Um, you heard in the video that the law requires an accounting to the court once every three years. In our court in Madison County and many other probate courts, the courts are requiring accountings once a year, at least for the first year. You can do a lot of damage as a conservator if you're doing it incorrectly in three years. So the courts have gone to requiring at least the very first accounting to be done within the first year to make sure that the accountings are being, the, the management of the finances is being done correctly, that the person is adequately bonded and knows what they're doing as a conservator. Um, how is the conservator's bond determined? Is there a set amount that determines if a bond is needed? When there is a conservator, there always has to be a bond. Most counties have a minimum bond. Um, the, in Madison County, that minimum bond is uh, $25,000. That's a $100 bond premium. Um, so usually the courts require whatever the minimum bond is just to be a conservator, but you, you have to be bonded in the amount of the assets that you have under your control, not counting those things that you have to have the court's permission to sell or do something with. So you don't have to be bonded for real estate, for example. You don't have to be bonded for car, the value of cars, because those things you have to have the court's permission to sell. But any cash assets, um, money in the bank, stocks, those things the conservator has to be bonded for. So if the person has a million dollars in assets, you're gonna have to have a million dollar bond. Um, so it's in the amount of the person's assets. Um, Sonia, I'm gonna um, go ahead and take your question. Um, if you wanna unmute yourself, there you go. Yes, ma'am. I was wanting to ask about at the end of the video, it was freezing up and I couldn't understand what it was saying about in the next video, there would be, it would be on, what was it? About how, the, how, gar yes ma'am, how guardianships and conservatorships can be modified and how they actually end. Good, they yeah, that's what I definitely need to know about because I have a guardianship right now for my daughter mm -hmm. and we just had the conservatorship removed, but I don't 
want someone, I want her to be able to be independent. I didn't know about this when we got the guardianship. I didn't, you know, we were like terrified uh, because we wanted something in place to help her. And um, we had lost my, both my parents a month apart. And so we got a will, a special needs trust. And we thought that, you know, having the guardianship and having her on SSI and all that stuff, that would be, it would help her and everything. I had no idea there was different options to it, but um, well, the only also too, yes, ma'am, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask. Also, too, I've told other people about these meetings y'all have had, which thank you so much for having them. I mean, seriously, this has been so educational for me. Thank you. And I know that other parents are they they really need to know this stuff too. Mm -hmm. And um. Is these videos are going to be are these links are going to be available to us later on? They are. All of these meetings are being recorded. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so will it be on the website or did y'all email them to us? I haven't checked my email in a long time. And I think, uh, Courtney, you may know this. Um, and I think there there's gonna they're gonna be on YouTube. And you're on yeah. I, I can, um, we are posting them on YouTube on an, um, a private setting. Actually, we did the last one public um, and we'll send you the link for those. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. And and, so since the next video in that series is on how to uh, modify or end a guardianship, um, will there be another one of these AARP meetings, Zoom meeting for you? We, uh, we actually had that presentation done earlier in this series, but for that one, for that one and all of these, you can also uh, view the videos on the Alabama Supreme Court's uh, website. Just, just uh, Google guardianships, uh, Alabama Supreme Court, and you might want to put wings in there uh, and it'll pull it up and you can watch them uh, at any time. Okay, could someone please email that to me because I'm driving right now and I can't write it down. Ann, did you get that? Yeah, Sonia, uh, um, if you have registered, then we have your email um, and I'll yeah. be emailing that to everybody. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So as far as, it, I'll just briefly tell you, as far as ending a guardianship or, or a conservatorship, um, the guardianship can only be ended by the court if the person has capacity to manage their own um, decision making. So normally that requires a um, medical documentation that the person's condition has improved to the point where they can make their own medical decisions. Now the guardian can be changed, um, the guardianship can be modified, but if the person still is not capable of making their own decisions, then they're going to continue to need a guardian. So it can't end if the person has not regained the capacity to make their own decisions. It can only be modified. So I hope that helps just a little bit. Um, Courtney, you had a question about if the guardian and conservator don't work together and, and conflict arises. Oh, I wish I had the answer to that. That's a million dollar question. Um, we have that. Um, I have had it as an attorney where I represented two family members who came to me together. One wanted to be the guardian, one wanted to be the conservator. Into the process, they start butting heads. The guardian wants to tell me that conservator's withholding money. The conservator wants to tell me that the guardian's not doing what she's supposed to be doing. As a lawyer at that point, I have to withdraw entirely because I can't represent either one of them separately because I represented them together in getting the guardianship conservatorship. Now, if someone came to me that I wasn't involved in the original getting of the guardianship conservatorship. So if someone comes to me and says, my sister's now the guardian and she never comes and sees my mother, um, she won't take her to the doctor, she won't do this, she won't do that as far as my mother's care, what can I do as the conservator? Guardians and conservators can be removed. So, and it doesn't have to be the other one that removes, it doesn't have to be the guardian who tries to get the conservator removed or the conservator to try to get the guardian removed. Any family member, any next of kin that has, um, or it could be the Department of Human Resources, 
that believes that a person that a person who's appointed as a guardian and conservator is not doing the responsibilities that they're empowered to do by law, um, you know, looking out for the health and welfare of the incapacitated person, um, managing the finances, mismanaging the finances. We've had conservators who steal money. I mean, it does happen. Um, so any interested person can come in and attempt to, well, that can file with the court to have a guardianship removed, have a guardian removed and another person appointed as guardian, or have a conservator removed and have another person appointed as conservator. So if you know that, if you have a family member that you're in contact with who knows that a guardianship conservatorship is not operating the way it should have, Somebody may be a guardian for mother and they just wash their hands over and they're letting her live at home in squalor and she's not getting appropriate medical care. That guardian needs to be removed because the person doesn't have the protection of the guardianship anymore. If a conservator is not filing their inventory, not filing their accounting as required by law, then the court can set that for a hearing and demand that an accounting be done and that the conservator um, show cause why they should not be removed. So these are not cast in stone. I mean, the whole Britney Spears thing, I mean, everybody knows what happened with that. But um, it, for the most part, things that the guardian and conservator are doing wrong are a lot of times done out of ignorance. They're not done out of um, a lack of caring or concern for the person. They just don't know. Guardians and conservators don't always know what their responsibilities are. We don't do a good job always of giving them good directions. That's why I'm so excited about these series of videos and training for folks um, to give them good direction on what the responsibilities of, of a guardian and a conservator are. Um, it's critical that when you go into this, you go into it with your eyes open as a guardian conservator, knowing that it, it's not an honor. It is definitely a responsibility. Um, Anne has posted that she'll send the link this afternoon or tomorrow. Um, she's got to jump to another training right now, but she'll send that out as soon as she um, has the opportunity to do that. We also have a question um, coming from or a hand up from Sonia Maney. And I, if I've mispronounced your name, Sonia, you can come off mute to ask a question. Sonia, did you have another question or is your hand still up from the last question? Oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. It was up still from the last question. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's all right. Not a problem. Just want to be sure we got your question answered. Okay. Anybody else have a question or concern that we can address today? I hope you've learned from these videos and, and this discussion we've had. Um, it's guardianships and conservatorships are so critical to the protection of persons with disabilities. Um, it, it, we need to be sure that we're honoring the persons who have disabilities, make sure their, their lives are, are lived out with dignity and respect and that the process gives them that dignity and respect. Um, and I think we are all committed to doing that. Um, that is one of the goals of our uh, Supreme Court Commission to make sure that people who are subject to guardianships and conservatorships um, are given as much autonomy as possible um, in this process. Anybody else concerns? Thank y'all all for what you do um, out there in the trenches. We all are, are doing the best we can do in the trenches these days. Uh, just one thing before we finish up, I, I've talked to a lot of um, folks who are on the front lines in guardianships and conservatorships. We are about to see the repercussions of COVID in our guardianship conservatorship system. Be, be prepared. Um, people were not being checked on by family as much during the pandemic when everyone was isolated. Um, that isolation has caused a lot of people who were doing okay not to be doing okay now. And I think our system is about to um, see that, again, it's the repercussions of what the pandemic did to our older and aging population. Um, 
I've seen that in my own practice and it's really kind of scary. Um, it, it's a population that we, we didn't realize was going to be so impacted. Everybody knows that children were impacted with schools and that kind of thing. But the older population has been severely impacted by the COVID pandemic. And I think we're about to see all of that kind of come to head now. All right. Well, that's all I have. I could keep talking, but I know y'all got plenty of things to do. Um, somebody asked a question, is this exclusively in skilled nursing facilities or AF or, or assisted living facilities or in general? Uh, it, it, both, Darla. Um, I think in, in skilled facilities and assisted livings, they were a little more protected because there, there were items, but um, people who were living in, in public housing, for example, or family or, or older family members who were living at home and were doing okay, as long as people were checking in on them, neighbors were checking in on them, church members were checking in on them, or they were going to church or to their activities. But when everything shut down, there weren't those eyes on people anymore. Um, your church members didn't realize I mean, nobody was going to church physically. So nobody was looking to see that, you know, maybe she looks like she's declining. She's not dressing appropriately or she seems more confused. Um, I think it's more people in the general population um, who weren't having interaction with church, social activities, neighbors, family members, because everybody was so isolated. I think that's where we're going to see the biggest issue. I, mean, uh, I don't know if we got Ann's question answered about confidentiality requirements on guardians and conservatives to keep. I kind of touched on it um, as far as the medical, as far as the guardian, the medical information has to be maintained just as you would your own personal medical information, um, except as ordered by the court, um, if it's ordered to release that information to others. The conservatorship, again, is the prudent person. Um, you don't want to obviously share financial information for an incapacitated person um, where that person could be subject to fraud, to um, someone misusing those funds. You know, you, you need to keep the account numbers um, as private as possible. Um, when we do accountings to the court, we don't include the whole account number because those records are public record. We only include like the last four digits of the account number um, when we do reportings to the court. Um, so it, it, you have to treat that information as you would your own. That's that prudent person standard of responsibility. Okay. All right. Thank y'all so much. Anybody else have anything else they wanted to ask or share? If not, well, I would like to actually say um, about the re some of the repercussions from 2020. I've complained about this many times to many different people, but my daughter's on a uh, ID waiver, mm -hmm. and before COVID, and before she got on the ID waiver. She was on the END waiver and she had. Oh, I hate we're losing Sonia. Um, we're losing you a little bit, Sonia. Sonia, if you can hear us, can you repeat uh, after? Can you repeat what you said after the END waiver? Oh, okay. You're breaking up. Got everything. Yeah. So my daughter is on an ID waiver. She was on an END waiver. When she was on the END waiver, there was um she they would have uh, her case manager would come out to check on her on her welfare every so, you know, every how long it was. I think it was like every 30 days or 60 days, they would come out and check on her. And then um the uh, her aides employer would come out and check to make sure that she was doing well and such and everything you know uh the, i think they call them like soup visits or something like that and since covid and since alicia she got her uh id waiver in february of 2020 
we have hardly seen anyone other than the aide to come out to our home, period. And her case manager was absolutely, was actually complaining to me that um, she actually has to go to her client's homes instead of just going to a day house to see all of her clients. And I'm like, you don't know if they're being abused at home. You don't know what their home situation is. Right. You need to know those things. Right. It's and really, it just, yeah, it's been tough. Um, because, you know, for a while, nobody was going to anybody's home and yeah. it's very difficult. Um, we cut out all home visits for clients through my office because it was just too great a risk for us to take something into the home or my staff to, to be sick. So yeah, we, we're just now beginning to see all the issues. And Sonia, you're exactly right. Um, we're beginning to see all of the issues from the pandemic. So we are. Uh, and I'm like, like I, I mean, I think myself as a very loving, caring mom and everything, but I know that everyone gets that type of treatment. I mean, yeah. sometimes okay. people just are ignorant and they don't realize they're being abusive and such and everything. You right. know, there's a different and better way of doing things. Exactly. It's just, I don't know, it's just all frustrating to me and everything yeah. on how they're doing As it should be. Yes, ma'am. I do understand. Thank you. Well, thank y'all so very much for joining us today. Um, we've been here almost an hour, so we'll we'll go ahead and, and end this. Courtney, I'll let you finish up. Um, well, thank you so much, Connie. And we wanna thank all of the members of the Alabama Supreme Court's Commission on Adult Guardianships and Conservatorships who have assisted us with this series. Uh, on behalf of AARP, we wanna thank everyone who has attended these as well and given uh, your questions and your input uh, you know we all learn from each other so uh, we hope that uh, as has been said that you were able to benefit from these and look for more uh, programs similar to continue to come out uh, through AARP's uh, website and contact information and all thank you all so very much and thank again you. You can, you can check the videos that AARP will uh, put uh, on social media as well as the Alabama Supreme Court's website with wings on, on guardianships and conservatorships. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Y'all have a good day and a Merry Christmas. You too.